Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, um, to Washington, D.C. I hope you have an excellent next couple of weeks studying these issues in great detail, which means I've got the very easy job of just being very depressing at the beginning of your course and posing a lot of really difficult questions and trends and challenges that are confronting you, but I'm not going to have any of the answers for you in the next, uh, in the next 10 minutes. But um, no, in all seriousness, my job is to follow from um, uh, Cleona there in giving you my sense of some of the key political challenges that have come out of the last couple of decades of, of African peace and security dynamics. And so the first point is on the trends that we're seeing. Um, I would mention, though, there's, a, there's another database out there, the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, uh, as well as ACLED. The Uppsala Conflict Data Program tells us that about half of all the world's armed conflicts at the moment are currently happening in Africa. There's nearly 150 worldwide, which means state-based and non-state armed conflicts in Africa, there's about 70 to 75, which is a, you know, a large and depressing proportion. Um, the second trend I would point to is that we have seen an uptick in violence against civilians, um, particularly from the Arab uprisings of 2010 onwards. The, the trend lines for violence against civilians and sometimes mass atrocities have been increasing. And the third trend I think I would point to is a sort of an unwillingness to negotiate an end to a lot of these wars. I think there's a real unwillingness to try and make negotiated settlements against some of the groups that Cleona has already mentioned, whether that's the jihadists or more of the, the militias. But without negotiated settlements, the prospects for military victory in a lot of these conflicts, I think, are, are quite small. And then I was asked to mention my thoughts on the drivers, and here I agree entirely with what you've, you've just heard. I mean, for me, the key driver of most of these armed conflicts is elite competition. It's, as Cleona said, it's, it's political competition between the leaders and, and the political elites of countries that are driving most of these conflicts in a top-down fashion. I, I don't see, at least in the last sort of 21st century Africa, I don't see an awful lot of conflicts that are really sort of bottom-up revolts from the margins. I see most of the big ones being sort of infighting amongst the political elites and driving pressures downwards, whether that's for ethnic mobilization, tribal mobilization, religious mobilization, I think this is really a story of elite competition. And as a result, as I'll talk about in a minute, I think we have a weird phenomenon of what I would call government rebels. And what I mean by government rebels are when the governments and their militaries literally split, like we've seen in Ethiopia, South Sudan, Sudan, Somalia, and other places as well. So government rebels, I think, is a weird oxymoron of a phrase, but I think it captures a lot of what we're seeing in the big wars in Africa at the moment. And the final driver I would add though, I do think politically climate change is very important for understanding local level conflict dynamics, not between states and, and not state-based violence, but if we're talking about nomadic and pastoralist communities and much more localized forms of conflict, then I do think the environmental degradation and the climate changes that we've been seeing over the last couple of decades are important, um, an important part of that story. So what are the challenges that I think you're here to study and talk about and, and hopefully answer over the next couple of weeks, right? What are the big challenges? I would just pose them as a number of questions at the beginning that I think we should all be trying to think about. The first challenge, I think, is managing expectations. Whether this is international expectations or local expectations, people in Africa expect high standards. They want the things that everybody else wants around the world, and it's going to be very, very difficult for governments and international organizations to deliver what people want. And so I think expectation management is the first big challenge on our um, agenda. The second big question is, is how to employ the youth on the continent. If we can't employ the young people and give them a better sense of the future, all of our peace and security challenges are going to intensify and get worse. So how we find jobs and <laughs> gainful jobs, right, interesting jobs for the, the continent's young people is going to be a crucial challenge. And as I said, I would link that directly to peace and security issues. A third question I'd, I'd pose to you is how to talk to jihadists. 
Now, jihadists are not the sort of, they're not all of the insurgents and militias on the continent, but some of the key wars, unfortunately, do revolve around this. We do not have a good track record, I think, of engaging in, in dialogue and negotiation. So how to talk to al-Shabaab, to Boko Haram, to the Islamic State, West Africa, etc. Uh, the fourth question is about the criminal world, the illicit world. It's hard enough to deal with the sort of the public face of, of security challenges, but we know a lot of governments and a lot of insurgents have also got their fingers in the illicit world and illicit markets that are fueling insurgencies, that are corrupting security forces. So how are we going to manage and deal with the illicit world is number four. Uh, number five is climate change and, and how to mitigate some of the worst uh, negative consequences of that. And then my sixth question that I think you will talk about a lot is, uh, is good old-fashioned propaganda, uh, or as we refer to it now increasingly, disinformation. Yeah? The, the digital revolution that we're living through has meant that humans are no longer at the very front end of digital propaganda. Increasingly, we're dealing not with humans, but computational propaganda. And so the disinformation that we're seeing and how we just understand the realities of our security challenges, I think are an enormous, um, yeah, an enormous set of challenges. So how we deal with digital disinformation. And then three more questions about sort of your jobs, I think, right, and your position in, in this. The first one is about how to professionalize security forces in Africa. Um, I would frame it this way, right, we know that unprofessional forces are a big part of Africa's problems. Yeah, corrupt, unprofessional, ill-effect, you know, non-effective forces are a big problem. So the professionalization of the continent's security forces is still a key question to, to grapple with. But secondly, the continent's international organizations, I think, are not very well set up for the tasks to meet these challenges, right? And the reason why is that they don't have very powerful sticks or very big carrots, right? So if, if you want to be in the business of conflict management, you need the big sticks of coercion sometimes to threaten people with, you know, intimidate them and threaten them with the big stick. And you need tasty carrots. You need incentives to induce them and persuade them to do the things you want. And I think when you look at Africa's organizations, whether it's the AU or the regional economic communities, they don't have those two things. They, they not, though it's very difficult for them to wield sanctions and coercion effectively, and it's very difficult for them to generate the economic power to wield um, you know, inducements and, and carrots. And then finally, I, I did say I was going to be depressing yeah, at, the, uh, at the beginning, but finally, you've got to deal with all these challenges in an intensifying period of great power competition. Now, this is not the same as the Cold War between the Americans and the Soviet Union, but we are entering, I think, a very, or it's going to be more intense period of competition between the Chinese, the Americans, and to some extent the Russians. And how this is going to play out in Africa, I think, is it's going to pull African governments in you know, potentially different directions. And how African governments manage that competition is going to be really, um, really key. Um, finally, I was asked to think about some of the... Um, the sort of the responses that African governments and organizations have already made to these, these conflict trends. And so I, I'll, I'll make a few points on, on that. The first point in terms of African responses, I think, is that the African Union is struggling at the moment. And what I mean by that is there's been a sort of um, a re-emphasis or a, a greater influence by some of the continent's states over the last decade or so in each of the sub-regions, you know, there, there aren't clear hegemons in all of them, as you know, but I would say powerful states have come to the African Union in Addis Ababa. They've tried to exert greater influence in the Peace and Security Council. And so compared to maybe the early 2000s, when I think the African Union was playing a, a much more influential role, we've got individual states that are pushing responses. And I, I don't think that's always helpful. That leads to sort of inconsistencies and, and problems. Uh, the second response, or the second sort of thing to say about assessing African responses is that there has been a backsliding of democratic governance norms in the last 10, 14 years or so, right? Particularly since the Arab uprisings in 2010 and 11. 
And as you know better than me, on paper, the African continent is very democratic. If you look at the AU Charter, the conventions, the different regional, pro regional protocols, it's a very strong connection between democratic forms of governance and peace and stability. So the last 14 years when we've seen a lot more coups, but also other forms of unconstitutional changes of government, this is a very difficult set of challenges. And you know, as I said earlier, Africa's regional organizations don't always or don't have the capabilities to deal with these unconstitutional changes effectively. Um, the fourth point I would say on this is that it's one thing to try and change the politics of wars, but it's another to try and change the economics of war. And I think it's very, very hard to change the political economy of warfare in different parts of Africa. Whether you look at the east of Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, the Sahel, the economics of war do not change easily. The, you know, the, the commercial routes, the trading routes, the airports, the seaports, the roadblocks and checkpoints, people have been running these for centuries in these parts of the continent. So no government, no international organization, no peacekeeping force is really able to fundamentally change the economic drivers of, of warfare. And again, that's a real, real constraint. And then finally, I would say, if I look at the, the African responses, there's no way around, I think, actually blaming certain individuals. Um, if what we said earlier was right about elite competition driving a lot of these wars, it means that wars don't happen by accident. There are no structural causes of war. Wars happen because individual leaders decide they want to fight and they think they get more out of fighting than they get out of peace. And what I mean by this then, or what's the challenge, you know, I think the AU, the Rex, external actors that care about these things, you ultimately have to confront particular presidents, particular rebel leaders. You have to engage them in, you know, let's say coercive forms of personal diplomacy, but without addressing individuals, and what's going to happen to them and giving them incentives to get out of the war business and into peace, I think we're, we're going to be stuck with some very difficult um, challenges moving, uh, moving forward. Um, I was asked, well, yeah, some of the lessons. I'll just say a, a couple of things on the, the lessons and then, then I'll stop. I think for me, when it comes to lessons for the security forces, there's probably three, three big ones, I think. Um, the first is, I, I don't think it's useful to think about a security sector in Africa as much as it is to think about security arenas. And what I mean by the idea of security arenas is like a gladiatorial arena, yeah? The, the security forces are where people go to fight. I mean now, you know, ideas, policies, ideologies, political principles. But this is not neutral bureaucratic terrain. Um, the security services are where a lot of these political and ideological fights play out. So it's like an arena in a, in a gladiatorial sense. Second thing, um, I do think though we should be aiming for services, you know, national security services. We should be trying to serve the people in our countries, not individual presidents. We should be trying to serve constitutional principles not individual administrations and regimes. I could go on at length, but we're having our own debates about these things in America, you might have noticed, right, over the last six or seven years in particular. Right? This is not easy, but there's no escape from it. We have to figure out ways of getting professional personnel in our security services that are willing to serve the people rather than a particular president. Uh, and finally, I would say then, thinking about the African continent, Security services have got to be affordable to the host government and the local governments concerned. I don't think you can build sustainable security forces ultimately with external finance. You know, yes, a bit of external training and assistance and support can be useful in certain times. But unless security services are affordable and sustainable on their own terms, right, from their own country, I think we're building sort of false institutions, if you like. And... We only need to look at what happened in Afghanistan uh, with the Taliban takeover and the collapse of the Afghan National Defense Forces to see the sort of danger of having a, a military or security service that's too reliant on external um, sources. So, as I said, my job was to be 
a bit depressing, offer you a lot of big questions and, and issues at the beginning. I have no good answers to any of them. Um, good luck.